So now what we're going to do in this part of the evening is we're just going to do a few quick uh, short cases. And I'm going to get some interpretation from our panel uh, in terms of what their recommendations may be for these cases. And I would encourage you as we go through the cases, please do send in some additional questions. We've got some great ones so far. Um, after these cases, we're going to be doing an interactive panel where certainly you can feel free to stand up at your table and ask questions, but we'll also use some of these great questions that folks have sent in. So without further ado, we'll start with our first case. And so uh, this case is going to focus upon preventive care needs in a young IBD patient. And so this is a patient of mine. I, I'm at University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, so I take care of a lot of college students. And so this is a 22-year-old who presents with symptoms for the past eight weeks. She was complaining of right-sided abdominal pain, uh, significant diarrhea, um, weight loss. She'd actually lost 15 pounds over the prior two months. And in terms of her laboratory assessment, she was anemic. It was a microcytic anemia. She had elevated inflammatory markers. Her albumin was okay at 3.7. And we did test for infectious pathogens. A C. diff was negative as well as a, a pathogen panel. And so quite clearly, um, we went ahead and uh, did colonoscopy uh, and imaged her. And so the colonoscopy and a subsequent uh, CT enterography demonstrated a long segment, about 20 centimeters, of quite active inflammation. Uh, fortunately, she did not have any stenosis, and so she was diagnosed with inflammatory ileal Crohn's disease and was uh, quite symptomatic at this time. So whenever um, I'm diagnosing a patient with Crohn's disease or we're talking about what is the next step in therapeutic uh, management, we really want to try to personalize that approach as much as we can. We want to get further information. We need to know about their employment, um, about their family and social history. This is a great time to take a vaccination history, as Frank had mentioned. Uh, certainly personal preferences. Uh, we kind of try to understand uh, what a, what a would a pill be better for them? Would an injection, would an infusion? We want to help to make them successful with the therapy that uh, we together select in a shared decision-making uh, fashion. I also always try to get at, too, what the patient's most concerned about in terms of therapy. Is, 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 is safety most important to them? Is efficacy most important to them? So we have some of those conversations to tailor their therapy. And so uh, when I had these conversations with her, um, she works as a retail clerk. Um, she enjoys volunteering, and she actually does volunteer in a local homeless shelter. Um, she grew up in a large family. And uh, I don't remember, but she probably even grew up in California because she really, uh, her parents didn't believe in vaccination. Uh, she had no prior vaccines. But she's now an adult, and she tells me, well, if you think I need it, I'll have vaccines now. I'm sure this has arisen for a few of you all in your practices as well. I know it has for Gil, so we'll get his uh, impression. Um, she doesn't regularly see a doctor. Uh, I find this very commonly in my young patients with Crohn's disease. And you're the first doctor she's seen in a long time. Um, and when you, when you have this conversation with her, she's very concerned about side effects. Um, and so this is really her primary consideration. So we want to frame our discussion with her surrounding the side effects and, what she, and, and using the right communication and language. But she also wants her therapy to be effective. And she's OK with whatever modality. She just wants to get better. OK. So this is complicated uh, in that we certainly have a, a young woman who is quite symptomatic uh, from Crohn's disease. She's a long segment of inflammation. She's already anemic. Um, she, she really is in need of therapy. Um, is this someone who we would consider bridging um, with a therapy? And we can talk about what those may be, such that we could give her the live vaccines that she needs. Or is this someone who we just need to treat, and then what vaccines would we use? Because obviously we can use some of those um, in, regardless uh, of which therapies we choose. And so, Frank, I may throw it to you. What are your thoughts there? What are your considerations in this young woman who hasn't had vaccines? What's your primary consideration in terms of getting her well? So this is a patient who clearly is going to need uh, a potent agent. And so what we would say is we're going to get this patient biologic ready. In addition, she has this kind of intriguing history of working uh, in a shelter. And so this is someone who we're going to check their varicella antibody to make sure they weren't naturally exposed to varicella. But at 20 years old, again, depending on where in California she lives, she may or may not have been exposed. We would ask her if she had chickenpox. Life would be easier if yeah. she had chickenpox. But we would, in addition to all the laboratory data, we would check her hepatitis B serology, check her hepatitis A serology. We would get a varicella antibody. And then we get a, P a PPD or a quantiferon so that we're ready to pull the trigger on whatever therapy you and she decide. Now, at this point, 
Uh, I would not let her leave the office if, without a PCV13 vaccine because although she's not immunosuppressed, she will be immunosuppressed in the near future. There's actually data that shows that patients with inflammatory bowel disease, even prior to immunosuppression, have an increased risk of developing invasive pneumococcal disease. So if this was flu season, we'd give her hepatitis, uh, sorry, we'd give her the flu vaccine and we'd give her PCV13. We'd order, order the serology and then you start having the discussion. And the next step is going to be once you choose what you want her to be on, uh, you may have a window of opportunity and maybe you could cover her with, let's say, um, budesonide and terracoded if she wasn't so sick while waiting. And then if she needs vaccines, you can kind of do them. In general, we can see what Gil does. In someone who needs therapy, I would be comfortable with giving a potent immunosuppressive four weeks after giving a, a live vaccine. But Gil, what would you do? Yeah, I think I, I pretty much agree with what you've said. I think it's a little complicated, this story, because she's had truly no vaccine. She's going to need to get caught up with childhood MMR. And, uh, and that's a live vaccine series that may take some time. So that, I think, is a little wrinkle. I don't know that I've personally encountered that scenario mm -hmm. in somebody who's sick. The way you've described it, certainly the colonoscopy picture that you showed, makes me want to get onto, her onto biologic therapy ASAP. Um, I agree if we can afford to wait, if we can afford to bridge, sure, but I would not delay therapy and I think this is, an, I'm sure Frank would agree with me, it would not delay IBD therapy in order just to, to vaccinate somebody when they need therapy. Um, it's interesting you bring up the uh, occupation. I had a very similar situation of a relatively asymptomatic young woman. She was in her early 20s, and I, I don't even remember how it was found that she ended up having ileitis, quite significant, 70 centimeters of ileitis, but she was asymptomatic. And we decided to start her on combo therapy, but because she was asymptomatic, um, we had some time. And it turns out she was a medical student who was going to be exposed to everything, including right. varicella. And she wanted to be a pediatrician, actually. Oh, and, even better. Uh, yeah. And so we did end up checking varicella titers, which were negative, and we ended up vaccinating her with varicella. Uh, it's two doses one month apart, then waited the four weeks, and then started her on therapy. That was a situation where even though she had extensive disease, she wasn't symptomatic, and we felt we could afford to wait. And also her occupation suggested that she would be at high risk for exposure if she wasn't vaccinated now. No, and, and what I'm hearing is, is obviously um, similar to my practice. And I would say that for me, it, it's a matter of how significant is the disease right now? How fast do I need to get them on uh, therapy? And if it is a scenario where you don't need to, you could consider using budesonide, as Frank mentioned, and I've used that um, to bridge to vaccinations. In, in the pediatric world, I don't know if there are any pediatric um, gastroenterologists here, but obviously uh, there are high-level data that compare enteral nutrition to corticosteroids in terms of induction of remission in Crohn's disease. And so in that scenario, my pediatrics colleagues have used, um, you know, an elemental diet, enteric nutrition, to bridge them through induction to catch them up on vaccines. But I would argue here, this girl's pretty sick. Um, you know, she's already anemic, her albumin's dropped, she's very symptomatic. This is someone who I don't think we could wait that eight weeks. Um, you know, certainly you could Think about trying as you're waiting for your authorizations to come through in that first week, put her on budesonide and see. But ultimately, I suspect that she's going to need her combination therapy um, up front. And then we're going to be working with the vaccinations that Frank mentioned, kind of the inactivated vaccines, that we're going to try to maximize those. But we just may not have the opportunity at this point to think about um, some of those live vaccines. Well, so, Millie, can I yeah. just jump in with one yeah. other point? Because of the homeless shelter situation, um, depending on how recently she was there, it certainly would check for TB now, but also check for TB again in 12 or maybe later weeks right. in, because she had a recent potential exposure that's absolutely something to be aware of. Absolutely. And it does also speak to um, uh, kind of what our practices are from that regards as well, in that we have to think about what the individual's risk factors for TB are. It, certainly volunteering in a homeless shelter is one of those. In the U.S. at large, it's a very low rate uh, of um, exposure to tuberculosis if you don't have certain risk factors. Now, we have those risk factors. We are healthcare workers, people who volunteer in shelters, people who travel to endemic areas. 
And those individuals, I will actually, if they travel to um, India or Spain or parts of Africa, I will actually, when they come back after a, a lapse, uh, recheck um, their quantiferon or their PPD. But as part of my routine practice for those who are low risk, I don't check an annual PPD just because uh, the incidence is so incredibly low. But this is someone who, with that homeless shelter volunteering, you're probably going to want to check follow it up, and this is someone whom I would check annually if she continued to uh, volunteer there uh, once I start the TNO. And so there were a couple of questions about this as well, and, and I think Gil mentioned, um, but we really need to think about what is that time period if you are going to complete live vaccines prior to thinking about immunosuppression. And clearly the, the two ones we're really most concerned about right here, as Gil mentioned, varicella and MMR. She missed that MMR in childhood. And so that you can do a two-dose schedule of the varicella vaccine, as Gil did and his medical student, um, separated by four weeks. Um, and if, if you can do it, uh, it was sufficient time prior to immunosuppressive therapy, but you need to wait four weeks after the last uh, vaccine to start uh, the therapy. And, and this can be that the, um, the Infectious Disease Society of America um, does report that administration of varicella could be considered in patients who are on those low-dose immunosuppressive medications that uh, Gil mentioned. Definitely not MMR. Uh, MMR is a much more potent vaccine, so any form of immunosuppression you would not want to give uh, MMR. Um, and, and, but again, MMR can be given in an intensified schedule, one to two doses at least four weeks apart, uh, depending on the indication, to try to make it more rapid prior to uh, initiating them on immunosuppressive therapy. So uh, sometimes we also have to think about what, what drugs are we starting and what data do we have for other drugs on live vaccines. And so at this point, there's, there's not a lot in the literature, um, but in terms of vetalizumab, um, there's one, this is a one case report that's in the American Journal of Gastroenterology, and, and what they did is obviously the FDA label indicates that patients should receive live um live vaccines on vetalizumab only if the benefits outweigh the risk. And so this was a case report of a 26-year-old with Crohn's, and this was during that big measles outbreak last year that we had, uh, and she had a negative uh, measles titer, and she actually received the MMR vaccine while on um, vetalizumab, and she had no negative sequela and, and, and kind of developed an appropriate titer. And I know, Gil, you had mentioned that there's another even larger series. Is that right? Yeah, well, with uh, other vaccines, mm -hmm. uh, certainly in the literature, there's a, there's a case series of six patients that I'm aware of, I believe, from Boston uh, Children. Children's that were vaccinated with varicella while on anti-TNF combination therapy, and they all did fine. Uh, they were accidentally vaccinated, I believe, right. not intentionally. And then there is also a case series in the rheumatology literature that I'm aware of, of 17 patients on infliximab who lived in an endemic yellow fever area in Brazil, and uh, they were already on it. They were living there. It's not like a travel situation. Right. Um, so they were intentionally vaccinated against yellow fever on their infliximab, and they also all did fine. So there are certainly case series out there. I'm sure there are probably others as well um, suggesting that um, that if somebody is vaccinated, at least we can be reassured by the data. And then there's a, a larger JAMA study that's right. uh, t talked about quite a bit with respect to the live zoster vaccine, um, suggesting in over 600 patients who presumably were accidentally given zoster because the person writing the prescription didn't realize they were on infliximab. Um, and for the most part, they also um, did fine. In fact, they did better than unvaccinated peers who didn't get the zoster vaccine, so they actually had some protection despite being on infliximab at the time. So I think that there is there's reassuring evidence out there, mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, we have to pay attention to what we think theoretical risks might be from giving a live vaccine and not be dogmatic about it. I think the concept right. of benefit outweighs risks. It's interesting the FDA says it about vetalizumab. I think it's true in every scenario that we do. Yeah. Every, every scenario that we encounter, we're always trying to optimize benefits and risks. Mm -hmm. And no. I would just pass, I would kind of add on that, look, yellow fever is really complicated. So I always try to understand, especially when dealing with college students who are doing semesters uh, abroad, where they're going, 
You know, we had a pace of a person who serial converted and developed active TB uh, as they had a pr fairly easy schedule because they went to school on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, then traveled throughout Europe on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday and came back with uh, rip-roaring uh, tuberculosis. So again, okay. I think we need to know where people are going and certainly if you're going to areas that are endemic with yellow fever, we'll send them to Travelers Clinic and let them s sort that out. And then for vetalizumab, we have intentionally vaccinated more than a handful of individuals with the old live Zoster vaccine who were on vetalizumab who clearly were worried about getting shingles. And again, I think in that case, clearly there's a benefit. Great. And so, um, I don't know, we'll move on, but I just maybe perhaps Frank, you could tell us. So she is really concerned about infections. Could you just walk us through that conversation? How do you present these risks to a patient? <clears throat> Well, again, you know, often it's not the infectious risk that's driving the conversation. It's the risk of lymphoma or the risk of right. a malignancy that many patients and their parents have on their mind. What we often do is basically sit down with the patient and the family and say, look, you have very aggressive, bad Crohn's disease. And as best as we can tell, if we were to predict if you were not aggressively treated, there's a 30% or a 50% chance. And again, a lot of this, you can either use models that have been developed by Corey Siegel or others, and basically point out that the risk of being non-aggressive is going to be associated with an ileocecal resection. And at least for the risk of malignancies, we can quantitate that as being extraordinarily low relative to the benefit. Now for infections, I think each of the drugs have a different safety profile. And so in a patient like this, where infectious complications and safety is the major concern, you may choose vetalizumab as your first line therapy. And so we sit down, we give them a number of choices. We often tell them to go home and think about it for 24 hours and then contact us with their choice. We of course will rank them in the order we think is best for them, but ultimately let them sign off on it and then uh, initiate the process of trying to get a, a prior authorization. Great. And so we talked about this, the TB risk factors that she has, and that the reason we care about this is that really the risk of serious infection is doubled uh, in patients on anti-TNF therapy with uh, a much higher risk for active TB. So this is something we want to take um, seriously. And if we did, if she were positive, her PPD was positive with a negative chest X-ray, we can actually initiate her on isoniazid therapy, isoniazid B6, that decreases the incidence of active TB by over 80%. And I'm not going to go through the data because they, I, my colleagues presented it so effectively, but other infectious risks you're likely going to want to discuss with her, the zoster, influenza, and pneumonia risks. And this was a nice table in a, in a paper that came out in Gastro earlier this spring um, that sometimes can be helpful um, in terms of understanding of the people figures, kind of the relative um, risks of serious infections, opportunistic infections, viral and bacterial infections associated with the therapies that we have. And that slide, of course, is, uh, will, will be available to you. Uh, and we talked about um, the, the malignant risks, how to have that conversation. I think the one I would point out, particularly in a young woman, um, is the increased risk of cervical dysplasia. This is potentially vaccine preventable, as we discussed. Uh, in fact, the, um, the Gardasil vaccine, this HPV vaccine, was studied specifically in um, uh, individuals with inflammatory bowel disease, and it was showed it had similar efficacy to the general population, and there was no risk of exacerbation or disease, no risk of flare. And um, so really this is indicated in something I would discuss. And again, importantly, uh, there was one question about this I just want to emphasize. It's actually approved in women and men. Um, it, it does protect men from genital warts, and then it also provides what we call herd immunity to the women um, to help prevent the women from getting infected. And so now that the FDA has approved this for use up to age 45, once the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices follows suit, then it would be covered by insurance companies in terms of vaccinating individuals up to a little bit of an older age. And so, in summary, um, really we want to talk to her about prevention of infections, uh, vaccinations. Um, you know, what, what I ended up doing with her is I gave her a few days of budesonide. She was not feeling better while I got authorizations. And she, after discussions, she ended up going on combination therapy um, at first. Uh, she's now on TNF monotherapy. Uh, we did discuss um, the, even the risk and benefit of zoster vaccination. Um, she opted not to do that um, uh, given um, her age. Um, but again, something I did discuss. And then we did um, initiate HPV um, vaccine as well um, due to the increased risk of um, cervical dysplasia. Was she varicella positive? Was she exposed to chickenpox? She had not been. Okay. Yeah, she had not been.